it's my privilege to be presenting here and I really want to thank the uh, uh, Boston team for inviting me to come. Uh, it's my first time visiting Boston and what an amazing city it is. But um, I'm really excited to be able to share with you some of the work we've been doing in Australia. Now, I know my topic is the treatment of head and neck lymphedema. That's a very big topic for 30 minutes. So in this part of my presentation, I'm actually going to be looking at our current understanding of the ICG lymphatic drainage in normal head and neck region and then what happens in head and neck cancer. And then we'll use that to uh, inform conservative management. And then in the workshop, we'll look in more detail at what's actually happening uh, and in terms of how we apply this to treatment. So I actually do want to acknowledge that this presentation is based on the work of my alert colleagues and in particular, Associate Professor Hiru Swami and Katrina Gaitatsis. So they've been doing some re research in head and neck. And in fact, this is new work. It's not yet published. And I'm really grateful that they allowed me to present this work to you today. So the objectives today are to identify the normal superficial lymphatic drainage of the head and neck region, then to identify the compensatory drainage regions and describe the compensatory drainage patterns observed in individuals with head and neck lymphedema. And I think, I hope you've got an understanding now of what we mean by those drainage regions and drainage patterns, because all this is based on the work that we've already done in limb lymphedema. And then finally, we're going to use this information to inform conservative management of individuals with head and neck lymphedema. So I'm sharing this slide, first of all, so that we can all wonder at the superficial lymphatic drainage system of the head and neck region. I think it's, it's an incredible structure and it's so interesting to start to understand more about how this lymphatic system is working. But I'm also sharing this because I want to acknowledge that the information I'm presenting and the current work that we're doing is looking at the superficial lymphatic drainage in the head and neck region. So currently with our ICG investigations, we're not really able to get much information about what's happening internally with lymphatic drainage and therefore what's, what's the best way to impact internal head and neck lymphedema. And I want to acknowledge that actually internal head and neck lymphedema carries a huge symptom burden. That's actually one of the biggest challenges patients with head and neck cancer experience. And so we clearly need to do more work. So at the ALERT program, one of the aims of our ICG research is to identify the compensatory drainage regions and drainage patterns that uh, present in common uh, presentations of lymphedema. And that we use this information to help us to understand how to best manage lymphedema conservatively. So what we've done is we've actually started to gather this information for the head and neck, neck region to try and improve our conservative management in this area. To this end, we've actually just completed gathering the data for a small pilot program where we're aiming to identify compensatory drainage regions. And it's very small numbers, but we're also basing this research on our, our the understanding that we have already developed of our um, limb lymphedema. And so our pilot involved 10 healthy controls and 20 individuals with head and neck lymphedema. And I'm really conscious that in the US you have access to these vast databases. And so you have numbers in the hundreds and the thousands. This is a very small number of cases but I think that we've, we're 
building on the 900 cases, nearly 900 cases that we've already done with ICG in the limb lymphedema um, knowledge. And I definitely think that we have some principles that we can apply to the conservative management of head and neck lymphedema. So this is our ICG lymphography protocol injection sites for when we're doing the mapping for head and neck lymphedema. So there are four injections. Uh, we have the midline uh, between the eyebrows injection here. And then either side, we have just in front of the ear. And we usually inject just in front of the hairline there. And then in the submental cleft, again, in the midline, there. So four injections. And from our pilot, this is our understanding of the normal lymphatic drainage of the head and neck region. Now, I'm going to go through each of these pathways in more detail for you, but I just want to point out we've actually also included here the axillary drainage region and also this area here, the posterior cervical drainage region. So these are compensatory drainage regions, and we'll be looking a bit more at those uh, through this presentation. But this is our understanding of normal. So now what we're going to go through is this first pathway here, so we call this the nasolabial pathway from this injection site, the midline injection site. And what you can see here is lymphatic collector running down that nasolabial fold, and that drains to the submandibular lymph nodes just in underneath the angle of the mandible there. And then we have an internal jugular pathway to the middle internal jugular lymph nodes. That laser pointer looks like it's shaking. It's very uh, wobbly, but I don't think my hand's shaking that much. <laughs> I'm not a surgeon, though. <laughs> From the middle internal jugular lymph nodes, we see a diversion, and there are two potential pathways. One's to the lower internal jugular lymph nodes. So we're calling this the cervical the the cervical drainage region, and then the other one is to these posterior cervical lymph nodes. We're calling this the clavicular drainage region. So these are the original drainage regions. As a clinician, I'm a therapist. I don't treat patients and massage towards the posterior cervical lymph nodes. I'm thinking about the drainage region. So I'm actually targeting the clavicular drainage region the cervical drainage region. So that's the first pathway. Then we have this temporal pathway. So the anterior ear injection, and we actually can see a preauricular collector that runs down the side of the face. This one drains to the upper internal jugular lymph nodes. So it's slightly posterior to the submandibular nodes. Then there's an accessory pathway. Once more, that's actually heading towards the middle internal jugular lymph nodes. And again, it diverges at this point here and to the same drainage region. So we have it to the cervical drainage region and the clavicular drainage region. And now this is an interesting pathway. So this midline submental cleft injection, we then see these collector vessels that drain to the submental lymph nodes here. And then we have this anterior jugular pathway. This runs either side of the trachea down towards the paratracheal lymph nodes. So these actually drain retrosternally, so you won't see nodes through there, but that pathway is actually quite a significant pathway and certainly seems to have an impact on the presentation of lymphedema.
So just to give you an idea of what the mapping looks like when we are doing our ICG. So we use a green pen to mark on the intact collector vessels and we draw circles where we observe the nodes. So it's from our control studies that we have actually developed the map that you see um, in, in the diagram that I'm using for you. And the way we report on this, so this is for a normal control. So this is a normal, normal person without any kind of impairment to their lymphatic system. So the drainage pattern, which is normal, is intact collectors. And the drainage regions are the original drainage regions. So we've got the ipsilateral cervical, the ipsilateral clavicular, and the ipsilateral paratracheal drainage regions. So that's normal. Now, here's an examination of a case following chemo and unilateral radiation. So these are the individuals that are told they won't develop lymphedema after treatment for their head and neck cancer. And here's the mapping that you can see. So this gentleman had unilateral radiation on the right. And you can actually see that it actually looks quite similar to our healthy control on the non-radiated side. But we mark the dermal backflow area in red and we actually use arrows. You can see here, we use these arrows and you saw those on the charts on Robbie's presentation to describe the direction that we're seeing the dermal backflow move. So what can we see here? In terms of drainage pattern, the left side we can see intact collectors. So that's just the normal drainage pattern. On the right, we have a compensatory pattern. So the way we describe this is intact collectors with Bridging dermal backflow. You saw that animation of what that looks like. Bridging dermal backflow to the contralateral compensatory node drainage region. And also bridging dermal backflow to intact collectors on the ipsilateral side. So on the left, the drainage regions are the original. But on the right, and I've got the the compensatory drainage region is in red. The original is in black, and this one is black and red because it's original on the left and compensatory on the right. But so the drainage region on the right, we have the original ipsilateral clavicular, the original ipsilateral cervical, and the contralateral paratracheal drainage region. So what do we see? We see that dermal backflow is directional. It actually travels with gravity. It, it drains downhill. And we can see that dermal backflow cross the midline. So now I'm going to show you a case who's had a bilateral neck dissection, radiation, and no laryngectomy. So this gentleman has had extensive surgery. He has free fibula, anterolateral thigh, and pec major flap. So it's quite um, a lot of surgical intervention. Uh, and I'll show you what's happening, I hope. Oh, there it is. So what I want you to see here is this is actually his paratracheal pathway. And can you see the flow of lymph through that intact collector? That's it anterior jugular draining down to the paratracheal drainage region. And you can see dermal backflow around his jawline and over the graft where we would expect to see dermal backflow in the graft. There's some fragmented intact collectors, that preauricular collector. You can see the linear pattern, but it's surrounded by dermal backflow, which is extending behind his right ear. 
again, there's some intact collectors, a nasolabial collector and then that uh, collector from the temporal pathway. Okay. So first of all, to have a look at what we saw with the mapping. So again, you can see multiple surgeries and I'm sure you can pick out the radiation fibrosis syndrome that this gentleman has. Um, but the, the dermal backflow is in the lower part of his face and in the upper part of his neck. And he has got those intact collectors remaining here that we saw flowing so beautifully. You can see the arrows on the dermal backflow. And I just want to point out to you here, there's a little black asterisk there, and that's how we mark a deep entry point. And again, you saw the animation for what a deep entry point looks like. And so we mark that when we can see dermal backflow flowing, it's directional, it's moving towards a point, and then it doesn't continue expanding, it drops away. And we are inferring that it's dropping to the deeper lymphatics below the penetration depth of our camera. So it's a slightly more complicated picture, So, but it's actually symmetrical. So on the left and the right, the pattern is a compensatory pattern, and that's intact collectors with bridging dermal backflow to that anterior jugular collector and dermal backflow to ipsilateral compensatory node drainage regions. So the drainage regions are the ipsilateral paratracheal, those original drainage regions, and we saw that working really efficiently there, and also to the ipsilateral posterior deep cervical via a deep entry. So this is a compensatory drainage region here. So what do we see? Dermal backflow is directional and it's assisted by gravity. Dermal backflow cross through scars. And in this case, with, with no laryngectomy, the anterior jugular pathway remained intact. So now we're going to have a look at a case of a bilateral neck dissection with radiation and a laryngectomy. So this gentleman has a stoma. So Initially, you can see a nasolabial collector vessel there, and it's actually draining down into dermal backflow along his, sort of below his jawline. There's more dermal backflow, and we're looking at direction. We're trying to understand direction. We do flick between the lit view so you can see where we are. Now, what you're going to see here is we're using pressure and directing towards a scar where we, we always mark the scars before we start and you'll shortly see where the scar actually is. So this is his neck dissection scar. There's the scar marked and you can actually see the dye flowing through that scar and so that's when we mark the direction. On our hunt for the drainage region. We're also seeing some intact collectors coming from the bottom of that dermal backflow and draining to the ipsilateral axillae. Okay. So this is the mapping that we did on this gentleman. So you can see where we've marked these collectors coming down to the axilla. Actually, he doesn't have as much dermal backflow in his face. It's all confined to that jawline and neck region. 
I want to point out, so this is what we saw, and I've spoken about this posterior cervical deep entry point, and what we saw was a dermal backflow that was directional, and you could see it crossing through that neck dissection scar. It was going somewhere, and then actually we saw this little uh, collector then dropping in where we've marked with the asterisk. So we can see the flow in there, and so it's going somewhere, and that's where it's dropping in. And this point here, we're saying access to the um, uh, cervical lymph nodes through this way, it's actually an area where um, there's metastatic disease in melanoma of the head and neck region. So I think this, this is a no drainage region that we didn't really understand uh, prior to uh, studying this work. So here's a complex presentation and it's different on the left and the right. So I've separated it out for you. So again, he has intact collectors with bridging dermal backflow. This is on the left to the ipsilateral and the contralateral node drainage regions. So on the left, he actually was using these node drainage regions, but also then the node drainage regions here and here. And he also had um, intact collectors draining to the ipsilateral and contralateral nodes. That's those auxiliary nodes. So the drainage regions, he actually used the ipsilateral, cervical and clavicular nodes in spite of that neck dissection and they are the original drainage regions. He also used that posterior cervical drainage region that we saw and actually from the left it went to both the left and the right sides. So both sides he was draining to, crossing the midline. And then he also had this uh, pattern of drainage down to the ipsilateral axilla, the contralateral axilla, and also a collector we saw going to the contralateral parasternal, all of which are compensatory drainage regions. On the right side, it was a little bit simpler because he was only draining from the right side to the right. He didn't cross to the left, but again, the pattern is compensatory. Intact collectors with bridging dermal backflow to the ipsilateral compensatory node drainage regions and also some intact collectors to the ipsilateral compensatory nodes. And his drainage regions were the ipsilateral axilla, ipsilateral parasternal and ipsilateral posterior cervical, so all compensatory node drainage regions. So what can we learn from this? So the, the anterior jugular pathway was absent. He was using multiple compensatory drainage regions. Again, we saw dermal backflow was directional. It was gravity-assisted. Gravity it flows downhill. Dermal backflow crossed neck dissection scars and dermal backflow crossed the midline. So our understanding in terms of unilateral chemoradiation, with no surgical dissection, it's very likely that your patients are going to be using their original drainage regions, albeit with a compensatory pattern. Radiation may disrupt the superficial pathways in the irradiated area, and there may be bridging dermal backflow to that nearest functional drainage region, but lymphatic drainage is going to be flowing with gravity. So it's not going to be flowing up. It's always going to be flowing down. But we also know that if we can palpate midline edema, then you should consider that it's possible that that dermal backflow is actually crossing the midline. And in the workshop, I'll talk a little bit about how we actually do that. With a unilateral or a bilateral neck dissection with no laryngectomy, then once more, lymphatic drainage flows with gravity. If the anterior jugular pathway is intact, then the nearest uh, drainage region may well be that paratracheal drainage region. 
we know that dermal backflow can cross scars. We're hypothesizing here because we're, we're still only very early in gathering our information. I don't have the percentages and stats that uh, Louise and Robbie refer to in our upper and lower limb studies. But if there's extensive edema in the upper neck, then certainly the nearest functional drainage region may be to that posterior cervical drainage region. Once more, if midline edema is palpable, dermal backflow can cross the edema to contra across across the midline to contralateral drainage regions. And if there's extensive edema in the lower neck, then the nearest functional drainage may well be to the axilla. For a bilateral neck dissection and laryngectomy, once again, we saw that lymphatic drainage flows with gravity. It doesn't drain up. The laryngectomy may disrupt that anterior jugular pathway. And if that anterior jugular pathway is no longer intact, then it's taking away one of the normal and near and gravity-assisted drainage regions. And that may mean that there's more necessity to use multiple compensatory drainage regions, which might correlate with the severity of presentation. But once more, if there's extensive edema in the lower neck, then the nearest or the upper neck, the nearest functional drainage may be to that posterior cervical drainage region. If there's extensive edema in the lower neck, the nearest drainage region might be to the axilla. But dermal backflow can cross scars. And if midline edema is palpable, then dermal backflow may well be crossing the midline. So to summarise, oh, hang on. The same principles of understanding limb lymphedema are applicable for the head and neck region. Radiation may be less harmful to the lymphatic vessels than surgical intervention. But compensatory lymphatic drainage may correlate with areas of neck dissection and a laryngectomy may be significant due to its potential to disrupt the anterior jugular pathway. But dermal backflow is directional and we saw that in the limb as well. It also, it, it flows downhill, therefore it's impacted by gravity. And we actually already inherently know this. Our head and neck lymphedema patients tell us that when they wake up in the morning, their symptoms are bad. And as they get up, as they move around, it improves during the day and overnight is the challenge. So that's quite a different presentation to the presentation that our limb lymphedema patients describe to us. And again, it reinforces what's actually happening with the body. We're, we're actually trying to work with what the body's already doing. But um, scars don't always block lymphatic flow, although I do think that uh, managing scars is really important and making sure that the scar is mobile, as mobile as, as you can make it, that's, that's probably going to be important because you could see in that case uh, when I showed you the footage of the dye crossing through the scar, you can see that it doesn't flow as quickly through the scar as it was flowing through the skin up to the scar. And again, we can talk about that in the workshop. But identifying the compensatory drainage regions and understanding the drainage patterns can allow us to personalise lymphedema management and care. And that enables us to empower our patients. We know living with head and neck lymphedema carries the greatest burden of all the lymphedemas in terms of management. And so if we can educate our patients about what's happening and empower them to be able to self-manage. I think we're not asking them to do the mass self-massage of a whole limb. It's only the head and neck region. It's relatively confined. I think that becomes a really usable management tool for them. And that 
that's going to give them the ability to self-manage, which is, I think, so important for this population. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you.